Well, welcome everyone. And thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Robin Ewing and with Michael Anderson, I co-direct the CREATE Centre. Before I hand over to Michael and he'll introduce our wonderful guests for today, I want to acknowledge our First Nations Australians, the, the oldest continuous living culture and a, and a culture that puts story and the arts at the centre of their doing, knowing, being and becoming. I'm on Darug country at the moment. The University of Sydney is on Gadigal land. You might like to um, tell us where you're from in the chat, but I also want to acknowledge that the land was never ceded, always was, always will be Aboriginal land. It's my great pleasure now to hand over to Michael. Thanks, Robin, and hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, CREATE webinar, and thank you for those of you who uh, it's, uh, are doing this at an odd time. We usually have this at kind of in the afternoon, so for those of you watching on replay or um, those of you who've made a special effort, thank you. Uh, the CREATE Centre, which organises these webinars, does one of these pretty much uh, fairly regularly every two weeks, every month, depending on what's going on. Uh, so if you're interested in being part of CREATE, it doesn't cost you anything, uh, please join up. Anna will um, drop the link in, uh, in the chat. You can join CREATE and you can know about all the wonderful kind of webinars and the other events that are happening. Anybody all over the world can join. We'd love to have you as part of that. Uh, CREATE's uh, mission is really to exemplify work that links education and the arts and creativity or health and well-being or uh, any area that really applies the arts in human endeavour. And what a great privilege it is today to welcome the CADENS team uh, and particularly Brad Hazeman, who has been kind of at the forefront really over the years of those moments where we see the arts applied He's been at the forefront of thinking about this kind of work. He's been at the forefront of making things happen. And so it's my great pleasure to introduce Brad, who's going to introduce uh, the other speakers on the panel today. Uh, and Anna's going to drop a link in the, um, in the chat that uh, gives you all of those detailed bios. But over to Brad. Thanks, Brad. Well, thank you, Michael, and um, welcome to everyone. It's so good to see the people on this screen, so many old colleagues or, and newer colleagues. Um, it's great to see Ashok uh, here, who's the executive officer, the CEO of Cadenze, and um, also some of our co-authors. So Linda, others from all around the world, it's lovely to have you here and to see you, to see you all. So, um, what we're going to do is, at Cadenza, we've been working to develop a program um, which really addresses what we see as an alarming problem in education generally. And that is that there's the steady erasure of um, the steady erasure of, uh, of really room in the curriculum and the, the joy that once was at the center of learning. And we've really been concerned about that. And for a couple of years, um, a number of my colleagues in Cadenza have been working to pull, pull a course together. We've done that. And we're going to talk about the fundamental dynamics of that today. Um, my two colleagues, and I'll introduce them as we get to the point at which they'll speak, um, the, the two people will be um, uh, John Holyoke from Lincoln Centre Education in New York and uh, Amanda Morris, who is now um, a very... Um, uh, Amanda is now the Director of the Academy of the Arts at uh, Charles Darwin University, and she's... Um, She's doing some really groundbreaking work in Indigenous and uh, Torres Strait Islander education. So I'm, it's, I'm, I'm so pleased to actually be here with everyone today. Um, they're the three of us and um, we're responsible. There are two other key um, contributors and instructors to this program. Um, and 
I want to send my deep respects and thanks to them as well. Jackie Cowley, who's a PNG native, um, a national, um, she's PNG national, and she's she's been a stunning person to bring in around matters of in other knowledge systems. And Paul Makem, uh, a colleague who's done a lot of work on executive coaching and how we manage um, the, the learning pathways and also what we've become known as high flexing. Uh, Paul's actually um, in Europe at the moment. So while he could join us, I'm going to step in quickly for a little bit of his content today. So to just move on, We'll do five things today. I'm going to start by talking about the Cadente program and the importance of a pedagogy of creativity to underpin our work as teachers and what its key characteristics are. And I, I'll interrupt myself to say the term pedagogy of creativity, I want to acknowledge right now, I first heard from Michael Anderson. We were chatting about stuff and Michael mentioned a pedagogy of creativity. I went, wait a minute, that sounds like a good catch-all phrase, not specifically bound to arts education, but to the needs of today. So that's, I, I want to acknowledge that to Michael and acknowledge too, we've tended to double down on that in Cadenze and certainly in this course, a pedagogy of creativity is its heartbeat, we feel. Then we'll talk about three dimensions of delivering a pedagogy of creativity. One is to do with designing intentions, learning outcomes, uh, ex learning objectives and expressive outcomes. And if you know exhaustively, if you know a lot about Elliot Eisner's work, then John will be ma meshing Eisner with the approach at Lincoln Center, New York. Then um, we'll have Amanda talking about learning pathways and how we overcome the brutality and the dullness of so many learning pathways. And I'll talk a little about high flexing, which is the modes of delivery and how we take advantage of the dynamics of, of, of uh, synchronous and asynchronous learning as well as, uh, as, as live. And then finally, we'll enter into a Q&A. And all that is designed to um, move us through be by 11.30. So let me start with some provocations about what's going on in contemporary global education. The very thing a pedagogy of creativity is speaking back to. One note, we're not to, if you happen to be in a working in environment where you are given freedoms, where these, the physics that are, are currently on the screen don't apply to you, then lucky, lucky you. What I'm actually talking about are those, those constraints that come from the system and the education system as we are currently experiencing or enduring it. So we're seeing the mass categorization and comparison, which is another word for competition. It's driving performance and improvement. The OECD is one of the key drivers of this, the PISA tests. So performance and improvement are expressed as numbers. We have a, a metric fixation going on. We've got trajectories of improvement that schools are, and teachers are subjected to. And the breadth of education is reduced principally now to literacy, numeracy, and it's all about improving test scores. There's a cloudy vagueness in the language. Everything's world-class. We're shifting gears. We're stretching uplift. It's that sort of uh, language that, of course, George Orwell wrote about uh, just after World War II. Uh, the primacy is on the skills of the workforce, obviously, numeracy and literacy. And now we've got the OECD doing all creative thinking. They've twigged to the fact that we need soft skills here, and so they've developed what for me and many of my colleagues are the most thin, irresponsible ways of measuring creative thinking. And just to let you know, for those of you who haven't connected with this, uh, in Australia, we're, we're fourth in the world. Our 15-year-olds are fourth in 82 countries. So that's how well we're doing in creative thinking. What's this about? What's the danger? There's a set and overcrowded curriculum. 
there's a question about policy. Everything's evidence-based and research-led, which, of course, we all agree with. But wait a minute. We, we learnt 20 years ago that so often governments just cherry-pick that research to pursue their predetermined policy positions. And, and is that happening to you? And is that what you're seeing now? We've got a predictable pedagogy. Students need to know what they're learning, why they're learning it, and then at the end that they have learned it. And of course, the way to do that is to have scripts for teachers, to have direct instruction. That's what we need for now. And then the learning pathways typically become very routine. Um, and, and often the dominant features are direct instruction followed by diagnostic testing. So, you know, that's a kind of an ugly, uh, a, a, a kind of predictable dullness um, that's surrounding much of what teachers are being asked to do. Work intensification, which is just, it's going to lead to massive, uh, massive teacher resignations, even in the net. Like there's something like one, one report is talking about 20 million dollars teacher, 20 million teachers needed globally in the next five years in order to address the, the, the teachers are just leaving, you know? And and so strategies for improvement. So uh, the point there is there's policy critique that the teachers can no longer have the time for. In Queensland schools, if a student swears at a teacher, it's a 20 minute work task to, to record that swearing. So, you know, the, 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 this intensification for teachers, and I don't think it's accidental. And then finally, have you noticed that strategies for improvement are all mainly uniform? Okay, so there's the critique. Please in the chat say, is this you? Uh, uh, do you think I'm being too harsh here? I do say this is, this is, this is something that we're distilling from Cadenze, but it's very much part and parcel in our view of the, the broader global movement in education. So simply, if we're looking at a pedagogy of creativity then, um, what are its attributes? And, and I'll talk about the foundational principles first maybe because these are very important. The first foundational principle is, and, and Guy Claxton's written brilliantly about this and we can share the link if you like. There is no single agreed science of teaching or definition of good teaching. It really depends on purpose and intention and, and outcome. So this notion that somehow direct instruction will solve everything, the cognitive load theory explains everything, it is not true. There is no agreed scientific science of teaching or th th there are sciences of learning, but no single definition. For us seeking a pedagogy of creativity, we need to be ever alert to go for flow. And this, of course, is Csikszentmihalyi's flow, his work, and, and that means being open to opportunity. It's not worth following scripts and closing down those moments. Was it D.H. Lawrence, that lovely poem, Bird in the Classroom? Like birds fly into classrooms. We can't, we got to pretend the bird's not there now with all the nonsense that goes with that. And then we, we need to teach students as individuals but within an assembly, we're not just teaching individuals as 30 individuals or 20 individuals. There's an assembly, a collectivism as well, which is our responsibility. So we've got to deal with both. So the attributes then, and these attributes are all evidenced in our program, in the Cadenze program. So first of all, and it, I mean, for many of you, I'm sure, hopefully, you'll just go, yeah, 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 honestly, why are you telling us this? This is very obvious. I'm saying it to remind us, in a sense, that for so many of our young teachers and for so many of, of the, the, the battered teachers who have remained, these are almost lost. These are lost stars in the night sky. 
So the first opportunity is, the first attribute, embody the whole person. Don't teach brains alone. On the important, in corporate ed, in, in people who work in this, they talk about the importance of staying with the senses, staying with the learner's senses. This, this links with the going with the flow. But that's important. And this notion that somehow you can only work with cognitive verbs, that, you know, we've only each got 20 seconds of working memory. Have they ever seen kids in flow? I mean, honestly, what, where have some of this babble come from? This is pseudo research. Um, I, I know I'm being provocative, but that's part of the deal, isn't it? Um, so the next, so part of that then, the next attribute is incorporating problem solving objectives and expressive outcomes alongside behavioral objectives. Behavioral objectives rule okay, well, not okay. Um, we need to choreograph learning pathways with the learner's experience and engagement in mind. We can't just, you know, teach the curriculum as if the learners are just there to absorb it. We need hey, Brad, to just, yeah. Sorry to interrupt your flow. Time. Do you, no, do you want to bring up the slide? Uh, which slide is that one? Did you want to bring up a slide? Uh, no, I'm right in the flow for this at the moment, I think. I'll, and I'll finish this off. So just designing in and benefit the learnings of high flexing. So that's, uh, I think I know, is, uh, was that you, Anna, speaking? Or was that Amanda? Sorry. No, that I, was Amanda, I, but don't I, worry. You yeah. just tell us what you want to tell right. us. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm nearly finished. So it's design in the benefits of high flexing, um, which is the synchronous, asynchronous. Like if they built schools, if, we, if you were given the task to build a school now, would you build it in the, 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 the forms we have? And how would you take advantage of this notion of high flexing? And finally, the last attribute, make learning personal and relevant. How do we do that? And all of these are the dynamics and the sessions that go to make up the, the course. Uh, I might just say, because I'm going to throw to John at a moment, now at, in a moment, to sort of lead off talking about intentions, objectives, and expressive outcomes. Um, just before, uh, and I'll, I'll say this about John. Um, uh, so John's been a key um, teaching artist at Lincoln Centre Education for over 20 years. He's been an extraordinary, he started as a, working in theatre as, in, as a, a theatre artist where he, he did lots of um, innovative form work um, back in the 1970s. While he's been at Lincoln Centre, he's done, he's focused very much on this question of child centeredness in engaging with artworks and the weight of the aesthetic content of our work. And he's been, obviously, it'll come as no surprise that he's been a great collaborator um, of, um, uh, of Maxine Greens. Um, he, he is now director of digital learning. I think, John, I don't have my notes with me, but he's now director, director of digital learning. And he's been a really central player for us at Cadenze in helping us build not just um, the digital dimension, but how we build a learning framework that encompasses the, the digital, the live, and the asynchronous. And that digital framework we're call, we've called Technology Enabled Creative Learning, TECL. And TECL is a product from a, a number of brains, John's and Amanda's in particular, but people who do the course, the, our, our, the program, the Cadence program, that's part of the conceptual plumbing of that course. So I think at that moment, I'll throw to you, John, if that's okay. And um, I'll, I'll let you lead into this segment of the presentation. With the tulip, because John, John is a tulip in our minds. <laughs> there you a go. Beautifully that's what crafted, I wanted. I, I needed a, the tulip. A beautifully crafted aesthetic work. So right, let, me, let me go to the first slide. Thank you. And my apologies for my uh, clunkiness no in this. No worries at all. So, um, so here we are, um, we've found what we've got here on this slide helpful in setting up thinking about objectives in, in a useful way within the course that, that um, Brad was talking about. So Eisner, it sounds like many of you know, 
uh, was an uh, expert in arts education of, of a great deal of influence at Stanford. And he had a way of thinking about and distinguishing between different kinds of goals and objectives. So the first thing of value here is the idea of focusing on the kinds of objectives as a lens to kind of look at um, lesson design. And so just to, and here are the ones that Elliot identified, behavioral objectives as distinct from problem solving objectives, and then expressive outcomes, noticing the kind of change in the language at the top. Um, so behavioral objectives, uh, as he was identifying them, would be things that stain in advance, uh, measurable standard of execution of behaviors. It's observable in the learner. You know it's achieved when they demonstrate that measured standard of behavior. Problem-solving activities ask learners to um, solve a problem. Um, there are going to be a number of variable solutions in play. The context in which it's happening is going to be more dynamic, and um, it's going to involve some creative, iterative work and also analytical judgments. Expressive outcomes, um, those emerge from open-ended activities. Uh, context is, is really open, dynamic. Um, the objectives, such as they are, are exploratory and inquiry-based, and they're going to be multiple valid realizations. So to give it a little bit more substance, we might... We might say that with behavioral objectives, you're dealing with transmitting specific knowledge. Um, it's codified actions or behaviors. There's usually one right answer, a contained context. Sometimes it might be something that's difficult or inefficient to learn by trial and error. That might be an instance where you find yourself with the behavioral objectives. Same if you're dealing with uh, a goal where you're trying to build some kind of automaticity or hardwired habit is often in the kind of zone of behavioral objectives. Problem solving objectives. So examples of that might be, um, you know, how to use safety gear, um, expectations and protocols, how to set up an app on your computer the right way, uh, game rules. Um, or in the arts, it might be how to use the right bowing technique so you do not injure your hand as you play your violin. Problem solving objectives might be um, applying a process or a tool in various contexts. So I know a thing, now can I really recognize it and use it in a more flexible, deeper way in different contexts? There's gonna be more than one right answer. And there's often a social dynamic involved. So that could be game strategies, using an app to realize a given challenge. I'm using an Illustrator app to actually make some specific thing that I've been asked to make. Um, playing a piece correctly on my violin, um, knowing what the right fingering might be to achieve the tones in pitch. Um, Got to figure that out. Expressive outcomes, uh, to give that a little bit more dimension, um, you're using an expressive means towards a personal or group expressive end. So oftentimes one of the things that crosses over to that threshold is having some hand or say and really fleshing out or defining what the goal itself is um, for the tool that you're going to internalize. It's a fully internalized process. You're making a tool or a process your one's own. Out of the arts, maybe you're creating fundamental questions and also creating the related investigations and tools. Um, within the arts here, you're really maybe playing your own interpretation of a given piece on a violin or you're composing one. You're creating a game. You're not just learning a game strategy. You're crafting a question to investigate and the means to invest and the means to and the means to test it. So um, if we go to the next slide, another thing that Elliot Eisner does that's going to be really helpful for us is he, I, he then goes on to identify verbs that associate with those objectives. So here are the kinds of verbs that you might see in a written objective. And the verb focuses us on what the learner is actually doing. So if you're dealing in a situation where students or participants are supposed to identify, memorize something, operate something, recall something, classify something, you're probably in the behavioral zone. If you're analyzing, um, developing, employing, uh, reviewing, representing something, uh, developing a strategy, you're probably in the problem-solving zone, and combining, 
um, interpreting, devising, generating, these would be words that would, would uh, relate to expressive outcomes. So the first bit of business when you're applying this is to sketch out the reason for uh, for the course. Again, just stating what may be obvious, an objective might be, why are you doing the course? Or why do you anticipate your students are signing up for and coming to the course? I mean, that's 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 what you're sketching out. That's your uh, that's your objective. And the use of having the um, these categories, and I find it helpful to think of them as a spectrum, which is why I've got the spectrum sign here, is that knowing that you be, it can begin to help you think about the kinds of activities digital or otherwise, that might be a good fit for the kind of goal that you have. And here in this moment, I'm not necessarily saying that behavioral goals are utterly anathema, but you know, it's good to know that if you're trying to teach somebody you know, the correct way to use a standard transmission, that maybe a quiz could conceivably be useful. Whereas if you are dealing with a problem-solving objective, uh, Dialing up a quiz is probably going to mean less to you and to the learner as well. Uh, if you're dealing with a problem-solving objective, role-playing, scenario use, those things may be the right kinds of activities to engage for the uh, objective that you have. And the same goes with expressive outcomes. If you've got one of that kind, um, creative challenges where people are sharing something in forums in a digital setting, looking at one another's work synchronously and asynchronously um, really might be the kinds of tools that you reach for when you're dealing with that kind of an outcome. Right, so that's the use, you know, when you think what kind of objective do I have um, is, is useful to ask yourself because it uh, enables you, as we've just talked about, to um, that intention and objective can inform the design choices you make, the kind of pathway that you build, and that is something that Amanda is going to pick up and flesh out much more than I am here, but to kind of foreshadow that direction, it's kind of pa enables pathway thinking. It also enables you to begin to, since this is a course on creativity, move across the spectrum from behavioral towards the expressive. So even if I seem to be anchored here, what opportunities are there for me to move across that spectrum? Why? Because of all the reasons that Brad has enumerated and elaborated on earlier, it's more engaging, the learning is deeper. So any opportunity to move in that direction is, is good to take. Um, and also knowing your objective in these terms will help you design something that moves from simple to complex, a real coherent experience where the activities build up or the questions move progressively deeper. Next. So how do you do that? I'll go, sure, I wanna move my course in a creative direction. Um, how do I go about the business of doing that? So pulling from Lincoln Center's work, um, the advice that I might be able to give you with that hat on would be number one, try writing your goal in the form of a question. And can you do it in the form of an exploratory question? Because oftentimes the kind of design that moves in that uh, across the spectrum is going to be based on how questions. Now, one thing I don't have between these two bullets that's worthwhile mentioning here is that once you have your goal articulated as a question, and incidentally, I is a great formation for it, as I do in the above at the top of this slide, write it from the vantage point of the learner. Um, how do I do this if I'm actually in these activities? So once you've done that, questions beget other questions. So if you've got um, an initial question, um, what, you know, it's going to suggest others in turns. What else could I ask in order to get to that question? And having arrived at that question, whatever yours might be, then um, what could I ask next that takes me beyond that objective question? So um, that's the beauty of writing uh, question number one. It helps you begin to generate more questions that are going to stretch the learning. And then how do you make it creative? Well, you're going to see if you can formulate a how can I question. How do I questions tend to be behavioral. How do I strap this bicycle helmet on my head is a different kind of question than how can I leverage this. 
and you're really getting into the more creative end of objectives if you're beginning to articulate how else might I questions. Because when you get to how else might I, and you're leaving space for that, you're leaving space for play. And play is the deep waters. Play is not children's stuff. Play is where you're really having the time to say, well, I could do this, but I could also do this. And I could also do this. I'm learning more about the solutions. I'm learning more about the means when I'm given that kind of liberty of choice making, which is where we're going to go next. So uh, next slide, final slide. So um, that's where we get the opportunity to go from simple to complex. When we begin to think about once you have written your course uh, objective or goal as an exploratory question, um, then you can do what Eisner did. You look back at it and what are the key words in there? What are the verbs? And what are the really important nouns? And once you have those key ideas, the first important thing to say is that in exploratory experiential learning in creative learning, the learning happens in the choices that people make. So your participants should be making choices about those key ideas. And when I say choices, I don't mean where they land on the choice. Like I give them multiple choice A through D and when they say D, which is correct, they've learned the thing. I'm really talking about choices in terms of, you know, the, the array of options that can have some enabling limitation, but is still an open array that any active learner has in front of them as they're trying to do something. So when I ch say choice, I'm talking about it at that stage. So participants should be making choices about those key things. They should be actively in that verb. And if they are doing that in each thing you do, then you're gonna find that naturally things are really developing in a way that builds or deepens. Furthermore, when people are making choices and the learning is really um, settled in the choices that they make, you know, participants know what they've made choices about. That's now prior knowledge after they've done so. And so you can build each step of activity in your lesson, in your course, on what they now know having done the previous thing. And if you do that, then your course will have a sense of progression and immersion and won't have, um, you know, it'll help you avoid the kind of I do this, I do that, and I do the other, where people have done um, a variety of things, but not something that they feel like has drawn them in or pulled them forward. So that's um, what we've found a, a useful way to leverage goals and objectives in a way that draws you in that creative uh, direction, whether your initial goal is, whether your initial objective is behavioral problem solving or no. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Amanda to speak more about those pathways, which is that draw. Thank you. Thanks, John. Um, we'll absolutely do that. And uh, why this was such a key piece of the architecture of our the Cadenze program was that our belief is that that work of Eisner's from 1979, that work's kind of been lost, not, I'm sure, for many of you on the screens, but it's been lost in in talking about education. And so we are seeing a narrowing of goals and intentions and expectations. And that's what we're trying to speak back to. My next slide uh, that you're seeing now and is, is, um, uh, uh, is, is Amanda Morris, who's currently at Charles Darwin University. Amanda, we were very fortunate in Cadenze to have Amanda work with us for a couple of years. She arrived after a number of international, she worked as an academic in, in New Zealand, in La Salle in Singapore, and at NIDA. And we were very fortunate to be able to grab, grab um, uh, that, sh that, that moment when we were able to work with her to consider the transition to digital. And it was just around the COVID time. It was an extraordinary set of um, uh, opportunities that we were able to clarify and, and advance with Amanda. Uh, I, I will leave it at that she's been at um amanda has been at 
Charles Darwin for it feels like uh, how long is it? Two I mean, years, Brad. It's not. It, you went you went there three months ago. Um, but so in that three months, she's done uh, actually in three months, she's done four years work. I have no doubt. And I'll throw now to Amanda, and um, we're keeping to time. So Thanks. let's keep rocking and rolling. Thanks, Brad, and hello everyone. Um, I'm going to follow on from um, John. What John was speaking about uh, setting goals um, and the sort of choices, I'm moving on to uh, uh, focus in on, on designing learning pathway pathways to enhance a pedagogy of creativity. And essentially learning pathways are made up of a series of instructional activities. Um, these are the really basic building blocks for teaching. They, they seem all too simple. I think often we we take them for granted. We we draw on a similar small number of, of activities that suit our discipline and, and our teaching style. Um, um, we we use those activities um, almost instinctively. Um, but it's these activities, these building blocks, uh, and which ones we select and how we sequence them that allow us to be intentional in meeting the learning goals that John was talking about, as well as uh, giving us choices uh, to be playful and creative in our teaching practice. Um, uh, in the program um, that uh, Cadenze has, has um, produced, um, when Brad and John and I were working on it, uh, we developed a list of at least 40 instructional activities, um, uh, which we can share with you at some point, uh, probably. Um, you I've might got like them, to... Amanda, I've got them here oh. and I'll put them in chat. Thank so, you. So... Thanks, Brad. That would be yeah, great yeah. because people might like to just review those 40 um, uh, and see which ones are your go-to activities and which ones you've never used or rarely use. Um, and I'd really encourage you to test out a few that you've never used before, just to uh, really stretch, um, uh, kind of broaden your options. Um, uh, I really do think that the um, instructional activities, there's kind of an endless, um, there are endless options uh, and it's in the choices that you make uh, that, that you can be really cre creative. So um, if you have a look uh, at this slide, uh, obviously to, to get a learning path started, you need to choose a starting point. Um, uh, so to develop a learning pathway, we choose one activity. Here we've got a, a list um, of some of them. Sorry, Brad, if you just go back to the earlier slide. Um, as you can see, there's a list of you know, possible starting points here. What we've chosen is we're going to start with a video, a bespoke video. So a short video that we'll produce, especially for the delivery of, of uh, our particular course. By viewing this list, though, of other instructional activities, we can keep in mind a range of alternative options for our starting point. We can consider whether we've selected the most appropriate activity to start with, whether it will bring the student group together, uh, provide a framework for the topic, whether it will challenge the particular group of students, um, pique their curiosity, engage them. Okay, we'll go to the next slide. Thanks, Brad. Um, and here you can see that once we've chosen that, yes, a video is the right starting point for this, um, for this course that we're developing, we then have the fun, uh, I see it as the fun part of choosing the learning pathway. Um, so we choose a second activity and here on this slide, we've chosen as our second activity, um, a creative task. Uh, a third one uh, we've chosen as a research task and then a fourth activity, a reflection. Um, we can then review the order um, and make sure that this order, this sequence will drive the learning, keeping in mind our particular context, uh, the student group and the objective. We can see the sequence of the learning pathway and evaluate whether the, the, there's a, a good flow. Um, in this instance, for instance, I mean, you might want to reverse um, uh, the sequence. You might decide that actually the um, research task might come be better to come before the creative activity. 
and, and the research could therefore inform the creative task. Um, so this, this slide we found really useful just to visualize for ourselves how we might start to shape a learning pathway. Next slide, thanks Brad. Um, avoid uh, the obvious, avoid repetition. It'll lead to pr predictability and disengaged students. Um, here you can see on the slide, you know, if, if all we do in our, our course is uh, choose to teach via a vi video um, week after week, we are going to, to bore our students um, and, and not provide the variety to engage them. Next slide, thanks Brad. Um, at times you want to shift, uh, you want a shift in I'm, energy. I'm, I'm not listening. Or, or a, counter, um, a counterpoint in activities so that the learning pathway has surprises and keeps students engaged with a variety of ways into the subject matter. Once you've, uh, you've got a se sequence that you're satisfied with, um, then we might want to think about the mode of delivery for each activity. Um, in some cases, the mode is in, intrinsic to the activity, but in others, you may want to draw on high flex options. So if we go back to the starting point for this particular learning sequence and think about how are we going to, what mode of delivery are we going to use, um, it may, we would want to, um, it, it, a video, a bespoke video could be, delivered in live in class um, and we all sit around and watch uh, the video, but it could also be uh, delivered synchronously online um, or asynchronously online where students can watch the video in their own time. So we have a now another layer on top of the learning pathway um, with our instructional activities and that added layer is the mode of delivery. The kinds of things to think about, I guess, that we'd want to think about uh, in if we have the choice of mode of delivery um, is what uh, mode is best aligned to the activity and to our group of students. Um, you'd want to think about um, whether activities are best delivered in person, in a classroom, in a studio or a lab. Do you need access to specialised equipment or a, or a venue? Um, or if uh, you, you're de delivering an activity in person, online, um, synchronously, um, um, via you know, Zoom or, or um, video conference, um, what's best, what's the best kind of acti activity to work online? And then for the asynchronous in environment, giving students flexibility, uh, what we found was uh, many, many activities really are suited to asynchronous uh, online delivery. Activities such as research or report writing, um, even individual uh, creative development and then, and then presenting back to, to um, peers online. Reflection uh, can work really well um, asynchronously online. Um, and then, of course, um, finally, the other instructional um, kind of, the other mode, can be hybrid, where more and more we're having to uh, teach live students in class as, as, as well as our students that are online at the same time. Uh, and that's a really tricky um, um, uh, process to, to engage in. If we just go to the next slide, thanks Brad, I've got an example here of a recent course that we've developed at Charles Darwin University's Academy of the Arts. And I just thought it was good to give you an example of um, the, the learning pathway, uh, but also then the layering of different modes of delivery. So in this instance, um, it's, it is a, a, an online course, the pedagogy of indigenous knowledge sharing through creative and cultural practices. The, the main delivery is, is asynchronous online. Um, and as you can see, I've listed there on that left-hand side under asynchronous learning pathway of activities, the sort of sequence of instructional activities. So we start with a creative task. We move on to on an online forum for sharing. There are 
creative case studies that students can ex explore. There's an online discussion followed by reading, uh, written reflection, and then uh, a kind of final task of pr producing a creative artifact or a teaching plan uh, to apply to um, the student's educational uh, context. So that's the, the sequence of instructional activities and the learning pathway. Uh, but for the asynchronous side, but at the same time, we're also delivering synchronous lectures uh, twice a week. Uh, the first lecture is a fairly regular, you know, a Zoom lecture um, to students. But uh, the second session is a, where we really have been, I think, innovating. Um, and we've been uh, working with guest artists um, um, and bringing them on board to uh, to engage online but as as kind of virtual uh, virtual um, field trips um, so that uh, students as an example of, of a virtual field trip the lecturer visited Gapuyak um, Arts and Cultural Centre in Arnhem Land um, and organised a weaving workshop and the students beamed in online and were able to engage with the workshop um, with uh, the lecturer um, just using her laptop to, to um, share the weaving process with the students online. Um, and then uh, students able to ask the women questions and engage in the chat um, and the yarning circle. Uh, a, a, a similar uh, but slightly different example was uh, we had a, a guest uh, lecturer, Dr. Shelley Morris come in. Uh, she's a singer songwriter. Um, and uh, she provided her music performance as a, as a podcast. So I, I'm mentioning those um, more um, uh, complex, I, I guess, uh, delivery uh, modes, because I think it's really important for us to recognise that now we're not only developing learning pathways, but also looking at modes of delivery. Um, in this particular course, we do have an optional field trip uh, to Kakadu, which is in person. So all of the rest of the delivery is, is um, online uh, with that optional, uh, really fantastic um, uh, option for students to come to Kakadu to, to visit um, in person. So that's the example I wanted to give. Um, I, I think my lecturers in developing that course have really found, found, found it exciting to play with uh, the sequence uh, to create the learning pathway, but also uh, really wanting to develop their own skills more and more in uh, use of digital technology to be able to, to really function well, um, providing uh, creative, that kind of liveness um, uh, that is essential when you're trying to um, uh, share creative practices. Um, this course particularly uh, is about, you know, relationships, um, uh, place, relationality, um, uh, creative practices, the, the senses, the liveness of the senses. And so how to do that online, I think, is a real challenge for us. Uh, but it's a, a wonderful challenge, I think. Brad, I'm going to leave it there sure. and pass over to you. Thank you. That's that's excellent. And um, thanks so much for, for that. I'm just aware that there is so much coming at people on this screen. Th this introduces you to some of the fundamentals rather than try to comprehensively cover everything. I, I, I would recommend um, have a look at the course on cadenze.com, have a look at the course. And, and what we're finding too is that increasingly people use these courses as, um, uh, as op OERs, open educational resources. So they'll dip in to this exercise, that exercise, and and take what they want from it. They, unless people are doing courses for credit, they dip in and out in the way they did with an, an encyclopedia in the olden days. So, so that's part of what we're, we're, we're expecting the use to be. Now, 
there, I, I'm just picking up very quickly now, and again, in the same keeping of moving uh, quickly, around this notion of high flexing, which is the mic a crash merge of two words, the, the, um, the, the hybrid and flexible. And it's from the University of Cambridge, um, and there are, you know, blended and a whole range of other, other terms. The, the, you can, from the University of Cambridge, you can actually download a very good document um, and we'll put the, we'll follow up with the URL for this um, in an email to everybody who registered for this course. And we'll also make the slides available. But the, the definition in terms of the Cambridge work is the names combines hybrid and flexible to describe a curriculum model like blended in which students engage, the main difference in high flex is the ability for students to personalize their learning and undertake different elements of the course at different times. So this is the, and, and the reason we went with this model so clearly and so potently is that our deep belief that one of the central ingredients of a pedagogy of creativity is giving students choice and control over relevance, which of course, a lot of the physics of contemporary education doesn't respect adequately. So how do we, how do, we do this? How do we high flex with a sense of choice? The other thing that was important for us as well in this is um, we're concerned as well with we, we're not, in Cadenza, we haven't taken a, an approach which actually says, look, you've got to go online. Um, and in fact, what we've done, one piece of work which we use to inform the course is we've said each, each of the settings that we have available to us digitally that we want to high flex with. So if we take classrooms and studios, if we take the idea of synchronous, simultaneous, as we are now, and if we take the idea of asynchronous, each of them can do some things really well, and I think there are some things they can't do at all. And we should, as teachers, be pretty clear about how we want to place the centre of gravity of our choice in these matters. Now, I think Sadly, for a lot of arts educators, I'm not now talking about people engaging in a broader notion of pedagogy, but for a lot of our arts educators, it all just has to be live because that's what we've done and we need to get hot and sweaty in a space together and that's what we do. Whereas in fact, and, and of course, there's an essential element of that. But is it possible to do synchronous and asynchronous with greater efficiency to reduce the teaching intensity that you're all sub that teachers are subjected with? Is it possible to do that? And the answer is we believe yes. So for us, if you look at the the idea of what's working best in the classroom in synchronous and asynchronous. And again, I don't need to read this out, but you can see, and, and again, I would love just comments in the chat to this because you, you can trust the fact that the three of us don't like, this isn't our preferred way of, of, of engaging. Um, but we've made the decision to do it this way because we want to cover a bit of content and give you the support material subsequently. So, so that's, that's a, a deliberate choice on our part. So if you look then at the classroom studio, where group interactions, where embodiment is essential, where you demand specialised equipment, the, the demonstration and correction of work, particularly physical work, with experimentation in flow, these things must be retained, we feel, in a classroom and studio. And if you're asked to do it, as teachers, we need to push back, I think, and go, no, look, honestly, I know you want me to do this, but this is impoverished considering the challenge I face. And this is a hard thing. How do we push back against those forces of that um, that global corporate education that I was talking about that, that really don't care much about your skills and knowledge anymore because the priority is to be pragmatic. Then synchronous, we found the synchronous was valuable for these things. 
content presentations, kind of what we're doing now. Well, you can do that fairly efficiently. Probably not hurtle through it the way we have, but nevertheless, hopefully you can understand the dynamics of this. For informal discussions, for global networking, you can bring people into this space, as Amanda has shown, in ways that you would never be able to do it if you were just live. So how do you structure interaction through Q&As, but not just have a free-for-all with 50 kids sitting in a circle? How do you manage that in ways that deepen the reflective process? And then, of course, the asynchronous, what we felt was, well, there's a pre-recorded rule, which is kind of don't, don't, don't have videos that go for half an hour or for 45 minutes that replicate the lecture. And if you do, you know they're going to just watch them fast forward. They'll watch it at one or two times the speed, one and a half or two times the speed. So readings, resources, activities presented, rich learning objects for this challenge of teacher incentivizing and teacher the intensification of teacher, how we use rich learning outcomes around stable content and you take the six minutes, you explain the dynamics of it and you can use it year and year and year. We found five years worth of reuse before it needs to be redone. I'm talking about stable content that, you know, we're, we're, how you hang a pattern, uh, how you hang a light, for instance, that's fairly stable content. Do a RLO, there's an investment initially, but then you get a time intensification release later. So I'm not going to go into all of these, but I just wanted, uh, we felt it was important to give you a sense that around this, it's actually about being selective about what we work best and how we actually can give up some of our predispositions and our own preoccupations with this. I, I want to just conclude by um, letting you know that um, two things about the cadenza. Cadenza one of the reasons I've hung around for so long is that I think we are genuinely wrestling with a cutting edge of creativity and pedagogy, both online and not online. So we're not simply going, oh, it's all got to be online, even though we're being forced to do that in some settings. Um, so one of the things that we've done is we have a number of courses for teaching artists, many of which actually um, deal with the physics and dynamics of pedagogy and the creativity of pedagogy. So we've got these courses and we've bundled them together for the Teaching Artists Conference, which is actually coming up next month in Auckland. So we've bundled, and if you're on this if you're on this registered, if you've registered for this, you're, we, you, you can access all of these courses, um, the programs that we've got, the basics of teaching artistry. And if you're bringing people in to work in your schools, how do you do that? What's the dynamics of that? And all of that, we've bundled that together um, as a simple 99 buck offer. So you can have access to that if that sounds appealing. The other thing Cadenze has done is a pay W-Y-W, -W, what you wish. We understand if you just want to do this course, the, 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 the one that we've done, The Joy of Learning the Cadenze Way, if you just want to do that, that course, your teachers, people are under pressure financially. How much can you afford? Can you do it? We, we can't make it free, but if you just pay what you wish, write to us at support at cadenze.com and that'll be okay um, because we genuinely believe we need to do everything we can to advance a pedagogy of creativity. Okay, so that's taking us to question and answers. And I think we can flow with back to chat on some of these. Um, Perhaps, Brad, I could um, just jump in immediately to start us off and ask, can you give any advice about what classroom teachers should do to bring this into their their situation? Should they be sort of starting at their own classroom level or should they be bringing it to their uh, their principals or to staff meetings? Like how, how do you get all this <laughs> into a dialogue in a school? Yeah, no, it's a it's a critical question, particularly as I believe what we're set, what I, what's still up there on the screen, 
it's an approach to education which is against the grain of our, uh, which 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 is against the grain of a pedagogy of creativity. So, I I, I think it, it is an issue, and what I would say is really quickly is this. Of course, you can do whole of school stuff. Of course, you can talk with the principal. Of course, you can do this. Um, you can tackle it. But in people who've struggled against, in the post-truth age, who struggle against systems imposing lies upon them, what they've been left to do is to do small-scale renovation. So what I would say is, Arm yourselves with the physics of this course. Take it. Dip in and out of it. Take what's ex useful. Take what, what the course tells you in terms of building learning pathways, writing objectives, making learning personal. Take it. Do it. And do it in your own classroom. And do it within the constraints that the external world is imposing on you, some of which will be brutal and will inhibit your ability to do it. But I think that's what I would say, rather than think that we have to do everything in a, in a grand gesture. There's a, 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 a great um, uh, Czech dissident who finally just talked about, great friend of Harvell's, who just said the challenge is small scale work. Thank you, that's very inspiring. I to that, Anna, I mean, in general, the second you want a decision to be made at a high level, you could take weeks, months, years, uh, a lifetime before that decision is made. So demand pull is often a better way, where if two or three or four teachers find it useful for them, then they are able to get together and recommend it to the, uh, you know, to the, to the management, et cetera. That's just what we found in the past. Yes. Uh, folk, this is Ashok Ahuja. He's the uh, Chief Executive Officer of Cadenze. And I'll just add that if you were able, one of the small scale work, but next step, if you got three or four like-minded teachers who wanted to do this together, who wanted to do the Cadenze program together, we would not only support that, that people in Cadenze would be happy to come online. Uh, we won't run the course online, but we will punctuate it to address knots and issues that you specifically are dealing with. Like, we're serious about changing education here. Thanks, Ashok. Yeah, I'm at a flexi school with very disengaged learners. I wonder which Cadenze course might best support me to take a radical approach in bringing joy, delight, pleasure and learning. The powers that be are slowly tightening the constraints, but for a little while longer, I think I could do almost anything on a small scale for a few hours each morning with some great tens. I don't know if you want to address that briefly with Heidi right now, or maybe take it offline. What's no, that's the a, a, great, a great question. Um, John or Amanda, would you have a thought on that one? And this would be a, a, a specific course? I mean, I think that... Um, I, I, I might uh, defer to Amanda to kind of identify what specifically among the offerings would would be there, but I think that those elements, if we're if we're high flexing, that really um, you know draw students' own knowledge into the classroom. So a disengaged student will be more engaged if they have something that is immersive to do, and that um, you know they feel like they're being recognized as uh, having knowledge. Yeah. Knowledge. I mean, uh, John, that's no responsive uh, teaching. No, that's a great first point. What I would just say is the work that we've done in session five, session five of the of our program, it yep. actually looks at seven strategies for making learning personal. Yeah, there so, you go. So that's so, that so, there, there, so I I go there. I, I mean, honestly, I I recommend taking the the, the program. You, you know, and dip in and out. Don't feel you've got a uh, like. We'll will Cadenza can give you a credit on it, and and you can add that for CVs and other things. But um, but but I think the 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 granular detail 
that you need to make this transformation and to survive and hang in there. This pendulum will swing back, but I probably won't be in my, I won't see it, but so, but Heidi, maybe you will. So that, that's the question now. How do you arm yourself? Because we are in such a hostile age. We uh, Honestly, we keep excusing what we're seeing and we go, oh, well, they're trying to do this and they're trying to do this. And yeah, no, it's teachers. I'm disempowered. I'm told I need to do tell them. No, we need to speak back to this. I can't imagine a group of doctors, uh, medical doctors, and us rolling on. Oh, the only way we deal with reading or blood pressure is prescribe this drug. No, we, 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 uh, we need to feel much more empowered and finding our own sense of stability and what we value in current education. And sure as hell for many of us, it ain't what is being forced upon. In hard times, Dickens writes about Gradgrind and the chapter, the second chapter of that book is called Slaughter of the Innocents. This is the ugliness and we should not, I, I'm just getting wound up about this, I'll shut up. But, <laughs> Brad, but, there's one other question. Um, um, uh, how do we engage, reach and keep up with the new generation of fast students? Um, and then someone else has asked, could you say a little more about, about what fast would mean? <laughs> Good. That was me. I just wanted to make sure I wasn't assuming on what that <laughs> Yeah. Well, I, I, to be quite frank, that term fast is, is, um, is, is not uh, one I'm familiar with. So could whoever put that in, just define it, John. And, and, uh, but if, if, one of the things by fast is that we're referring to uh, constant distraction. The 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 the, the that we, we are in our, our students are fundamentally changed, and uh, as well. So there the, the, the there is a there's an actual term for it. I'm just got, not retrieving it, um, but but it is. The, the 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 short attention span and the constant endless distraction um, that that, uh, that that we're capable of. Has somebody thrown up fast for us yet? Thank you for answering. Is um, what you just said uh, the the very uh, little attention uh, they they have, but also they are very. Uh, capable and very smart in uh, engaging new technologies and sometimes even though I, I am young and close to them uh, I feel uh, they are uh, one or two uh, or three steps ahead uh, my, of myself and uh, I don't want to, uh, to lose this race and I feel that it's very important to uh, stay very close to them and even even a, uh, a step aside them and I find this very difficult uh, nowadays with this new fast generation fast I, I, it's not a term uh, that I found uh, it's uh, uh, something that I came up uh, uh, this morning <laughs> uh, listening to you uh, and I was wondering if um, and some of your uh, thoughts inspired me to uh, and I, I have uh, notes uh, to apply into my courses but uh, if you have some advice regarding this uh, new generation and how to approach it and how to uh, keep it um, connected Engage, yeah connect, connected and engaged and and uh, I, I'll I'm, I'm just going to cover for 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 my two colleagues who will have plenty to say on this, I'm sure. Just to say, the one of the things the OECD, the OECD has done is school, you know, in school refusal, kids not wanting to go to school anymore. And the school, the, the three reasons are I was sick, COVID. The second reason is I didn't feel safe at school or going to school. Like, th th this is a huge, a huge issue. And the third thing is I'm bored. So, so how we take into account the fast syndrome is crucial. And these are the three key drivers. And what's happening in 
Australia is it's now being called emotional refuse, emotional, the emotional reasons for school refusal. So it's being linked to a, a medical problem. It's not a curriculum design problem. It's a medical problem. It's the kind of thing Ken Robinson talked about endlessly that, you know, we've stimulated our kids, and this goes back in part to your answer, we've stimulated our kids like never before, and then when they won't sit still, we drug them. Mm -hmm. Seriously, is this the solution? So how do, we, how do we address this as a learning design issue rather than a medical problem? So I don't know if uh, we're also, re I realise we're now two minutes over and we probably should wind up, but I'm just wondering quickly if John or Amanda would have something to say quickly. And while they're doing that, if while if those of you who are still here, can you put something in the chat that we could follow up with you on? Um, because we will send an email um, we, we, that it will create, we'll send the email. We obviously privacy we, we won't but the fact that you've registered with create we'll send some follow-up materials including these slides and don't just tell us what you're comfortable with what you know what what what, what went too far what 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 what's not been um addressed adequately so um i think amanda john do you want to have anything to say about the the fast situation oh look i i think uh, in terms of just referring back to learning pathways uh, and choice of instructional activities, you, you can incorporate more and more of a range of um, engagement with digital technology so that the students are able to, to see that they can excel um, in um, engaging through digital technology, even if they are two, two or three steps ahead of you, um, maybe celebrate that. Um, find, find a way to, uh, you know, activities that can, um, uh, they can showcase their, their skills and their expertise. But uh, I would be thinking about also finding um, how you intersperse those digital activities with other other activities that engage with the senses allow for more reflection reflective activity um, uh, so that's just off the top of my head thank you i would say uh, yeah parallel to that uh, in terms of the field trips which was on the menu is good for that i'm an you know old school lingering is a muscle Lingering is a kind of capacity that needs exercise. So it's the extension that we're going for. And man, you know, artworks are great for that. They're inexhaustible resources for, for a kind of engagement. So um, taking people out of a learning context into a museum and making people, not making, but engaging people in a conversation around one piece for longer and longer periods of time exercises the muscle. And then I think also to Amanda's point, kind of going with it, allowing them to learn and research in the channels they know, but then challenging them once enabling those cha those channels to do so in increasingly su substantive ways. So I, I think the challenge is the kind of the kind of constant flipping once you hit the barrier of boredom that comes with an Instagram, mm -hmm. enabling them to go into the tool, but challenging them at times to constantly kind of extend their focus with anything they're engaging with, either in the tool they know or in the context that are different for them. Thank you, John. Thank you and so much. Yeah, no, both of those were really terrific comments. Any last things? Uh, there's some terrific um, stuff in the chat, um, just in terms of places to go and who to look at, um, following up on those ideas. Um, and uh, probably the last thing I'd, I'd say is that for some of the stuff have moral panic agendas. So be careful as we read this. And it was lovely your comment, Heidi, that they're ahead of us in many ways as well. So there's a danger in actually portraying this, this, this as an entirely deficit and, and again, a, an emotional problem that probably we should start medicating our children about. Anyway, I will think we should wind up at that point. Um, and um, I, I just any last comments? We will copy the, 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 the chat. It will be great for us to have uh, to refer back to. And 
if you'd like to follow up in any way, we certainly will. So I think at that point, um, uh, Anna or Michael or Robin, we'll leave, we'll leave the, the final goodbye to your, in, in your hands. Thanks very much, Brad. Um, such a fantastic and um, really thought-provoking uh, session again. Uh, thanks to John, thanks to Amanda. Um, and of course, if uh, people want to follow up, um, they can follow you uh, or John and Amanda. Where, where should they go, Brad, if they want to take this further? Uh, well, cadenze.com, cadenze.com, um, and I'll, I'll put a bit a bit in there. Cadenze.com will will connect you there. Um, my platform, the only platform I really use any longer is LinkedIn. So I'd be, I'd welcome um, any perspectives and comments there. Um, and um, I, I think, um, and and I, I'm Brad at cadenze.com. So it's pretty straightforward to, uh, right. to, to, to do that. Brad at cadenze.com. And I'd great. welcome. Yep. Thanks, mate. Thanks so much. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day or a great Thank evening, you. depending on where you are. You See you later. Thank, Thank you. Bye, Bye, Bye now. Goodbye. Bye.